Uh, well, how are we doing tonight? Was that, was that good? I so much enjoyed both of those uh, presentations, both of those sermons, really, really good. But you did notice that we're talking about two uh, aspects of vocation or calling. Vodi was focused on the local church, our calling into the local church as Christians. Tom broadened it out to think more about the Christians calling in society. We need to bring those two together, don't we? So I just want to pitch a question. What is primary? If we think about calling, what's primary and why? Like, which, which sermon of yours is better? Most, if we've got to listen to one. They're, they're two sides of the same coin, right? I mean, we, we are equipped in that community, right? And, and encouraged in that community so that we can be effective outside you know so it's it it's not an either or it, it's a both and um and I, I you know sometimes our um and for some of us our priority will be the one or the other right if you're serving in pastoral ministry um and, and that's where your calling is then you 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 really are um giving more of your life and yourself um you know, to that one area or calling, whereas someone, you know, else may be giving more of their um, life and, and gifts to that outside calling. But in the end, um, it, it all works together. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's uh, the call to Christ is to be part of the body of Christ. And as you mentioned, you can't have Christ fully and reject his body, reject his bride. So that's where we grow. That's where we learn. That's where we are equipped, and we, we do that together. We do life together. It's, so it's, we assemble. The church is the assembly, but we're not assembled 24-7, and we have our lives that have various spheres of opportunity to impact our callings individually, but it's that called community that enables us to continue on being what God's called us to do and the opportunities he's given us individually. Yeah, you see that pattern in, in uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 4 to 6, where you see uh, Paul teaching about the local church in Ephesians chapter 4, and then there's the effect of the Spirit's filling and the Word of Christ dwelling in us richly, going into the family, in the home, and then outside into the workplace, uh, underneath authority out there. So you see that connection all the way through. Two sides of the same coin, indeed. Um, why is it so vital then that a, a Christian, uh, even if he is spending a lot of time outside the home in a vocational, uh, you know, something outside the home, a vocation, I mean, you've got politicians, uh, you've got people who work in various manufacturing or any kind of industry, why is it vital that he must be in that local church developing that intimacy for the good of his calling? Um, you know, we need and have to have the ordinary means of grace, right? I mean, that, that work in us, that, that sanctifying work in us where we're growing in grace um, is something that, that depends greatly on those ordinary means of grace. Um, and, and sitting under and devoting ourselves to those ordinary means of grace, the the, the ministry of his, his word um, and the ways that his, his word ministers to us. So, um, I mean, that, that's, it, it's vital. You, there's, there's, there's nothing without that. You know. Yeah, the, the church isn't an afterthought with God. And the church is the way that he matures us. The church is the way that he will develop us and will ultimately uh, equip us to be useful in whatever spheres we have. So the, the idea that you can follow Christ, know Christ, be a faithful Christian, and intentionally separate yourself from the church is just a foreign idea to the scripture. There, there may be circumstances, you can be in prison, you can uh, be sick, you can go to war, whatever. There might be things like that, but those are the exceptions to the rule. If, if you are intentionally 
staying away from the kind of community Bodhi talked about, and you think you are following Christ, there's something bad wrong in your thinking. And I've had this conversation a lot of times as a pastor with people that are pretty much what you were describing. And I just start going down the list with them. Look at the things that you cannot do, that, that the Bible calls you to do. You, you just can't do it. You're not doing it because you're not living with God's people in a covenanted relationship in a church. And so for you to think that you're okay with God or that you're growing as a Christian while you're neglecting all of these things, you've just figured out a way to kind of carve out what you think is Christianity or vital Christianity to the neglect of what God has actually said. And it's an indication of just kind of how badly you've been duped. And you really need people who aren't you speaking into your life. One of the... Um I've got to imagine there's a number of influences. Let me just ask the question. What, what are the influences, do you think, in our modern world that uh, make an online experience, that trying to build online community, build online intimacy, uh, people reaching out to you thousands of miles away, sharing very intimate things, why do you think that's more attractive to many people? What is it in our world that's creating that appetite? And causing them to shun the in-person intimacy and experience. I, I think there's been a, a, a transition and transformation in our thinking and understanding and worldview. There, there's a, a generation of people who have grown up in an environment where everything that they consider to be real happens on a screen. Like everything they do and everything they've done, you know, some for all their lives, right? Um, I mean, everything happens on a screen. Everything that you want, everything that you need, um, you, you get it on the screen. You don't, you don't cook your food, you go to your phone and you know, go to an app and you tell somebody to bring it to you, right? Um, you, you, we don't go to class or go to school. Um, you, you do it all, you know, online. Um, I mean, it, so so many of these things, right? They're just it, it's it's life on the screen, and it's becoming more and more pervasive. Um, not to say that screens are inherently bad things, right? Um, it, 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 like I said in the message, that there's, it's been a great benefit and it's a great blessing, you know, to be able to have access to some of the things that we have access to, but there's a cost to it as well. His answer stands. Yeah, amen. I mean, there's a couple of books I'd recommend. One is uh, Neil Postman, uh, Amusing Ourselves to yes. Death. It's dated, but it's still very, very relevant. And then I've just forgotten the author's name, The Shallows. Uh, what's that guy's name? Nick? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. What, what the internet is doing to our to brains. Our brains yeah. you know, it's a fantastic it, book. Yeah, I mean, we're, just, we're being discipled 24-7 yeah. um, by technology. and even not, not, The content is one thing, but it's the method right. of delivery. We've gone from a linear age and way of thinking to uh, a, a photographic, image-based uh, way of thinking. And the commercials, television commercials, I don't even know if people still make television commercials. I don't watch television shows the way that they used to be watched. Uh, but the commercials, you know, whether it's the, the Nike commercial, just do it. You know, you have 27 images, boom, 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 yeah. boom, just do it. Yeah. There's no message there, but they, yeah. somebody paid somebody a lot of money to figure out that's a good way to get you to buy their shoes. Yeah. And so we're just being discipled that way. Yeah, a lot of smart people trying to get our attention and keep our attention, keep us distracted, so we'll buy, 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 mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things that I think young people especially can observe uh, about all their online heroes, or I shouldn't say all, but many, of, many online heroes is the fact that uh, even, even within <coughs> evangelicalism and even in some places in conservative, reformed evangelicalism, they find their online heroes are not nailed down to a local church. Yeah. So right. they're, they're on the move all the time. And there are some people, uh, even in that, in that sphere, who do a lot to curate their image uh, and how they come across online and they uh, take several takes before they post it online. So 
there's a lot being done, I think, within our own circles. I think of a um, pretty, pretty big name that fell. He's now passed away, but uh, pretty, pretty tr uh, significant scandal. Yeah. And he was not nailed down to a local church. Yeah. He was not under the authority of a local church. If you could talk to somebody like that in their younger days as they're building a ministry, what would you tell them to encourage them for the sake of those who hear them what to do differently? Why? Mm. Yeah, and, and that's not new. Mm. Um, I mean, Billy Graham was, lived his whole life in North Carolina, but he was a member of First Baptist Dallas, right? How does that work? Yeah, how does, how does that work? And, and how does First Baptist Dallas even allow that? They allow that because that, that, that idea is something that we accepted a long time ago. Yeah, his name's right? on their rolls. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it, you know we're more famous because that famous name is 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 on our rolls, um, and I I think that's something that that we have to just address from this biblical theological perspective, right? We have to have that theological argument of what the local church is, what the value of the local church is, and we have to press that um, upon people and. Con confront that. Um, what if they say something like, your calling is more to the local church. My calling is larger than that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I'm more needful yeah. to the Lord. Obviously, he's given me these gifts. Yeah, yeah. I got to curate these gifts. I got I a stewardship of these gifts to give an account for. Yeah. So they're arguing, they're making that argument. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing larger. So you ain't special. You know, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I, I know. I, <laughs> no, I mean, I would say that the, the word of God applies to you, too. That's the thing. Yeah. You're trying to teach the word. You're defying the word. It's and we, there's a I've had encounter with a guy locally like that. Well known. Uh, yeah. You know, he's got a ministry. He's done some things, goes into churches and does certain sorts of training and was convinced he ought to do it at our church. And uh, it just didn't go so well. You know, I said, well, where, where are you a member? Oh, I'm not a member anywhere. I said, well, you're not going to do that here. Yeah. You know? So um, it's, it's, it, you're setting yourself up for a disaster. You're not special. You're not special. We all need what God has provided for every Christian in the church. And to think that you are safe by living outside of that. So I mean, what I would say to your question, to a guy like that or myself, is men, you, you need to anchor your life with the people of God. Be willing to know and be known. You know, have people in your life that are willing to hold you accountable. Uh, you need that, and everybody needs that. No, nobody's above that, yeah. and it's a gift of God. Yeah, so I, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, but here goes. Um, how do you guys do that for your own ministries? Who's, who's uh, watching your life and keeping you anchored down? I stay in one church for 35 years. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, no, I mean, it, it, yeah. God's done that, and to have godly elders. Right. You know, have elders that don't take any stuff off of you. Uh, That's what I'm trying to draw. Out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's really good, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, I quit trying to fool these guys a long time ago. Yeah, that, so. it's, yeah, absolutely, it's yeah. essential. And but but you have to have a commitment to that costly intimacy, yeah. right? Because you can, um, you know, be a part of a, a church, right, um, and still not have a commitment to that costly intimacy. Uh, and it's to your own detriment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, our souls need to be shepherded. Mm -hmm. Every Christian needs that. The minute we start to believe that our souls don't need to be shepherded, um, you know, we, we've made ourselves pray to that roaring lion who's mm -hmm. seeking whom he may devour, you know? And I live in the land of lions, <laughs> you know? And they look, they look for stragglers. <laughs> Yeah, like, an, like one of those antelope out there with a puffed up chest. Yeah, man. <laughs> nah. Straying from the herd. Nah. Ain't going to happen, is yeah. it? Nah. He's, he's lunch. Let me mention one other thing, too. I mean, this is something I think every man needs to do this, every married man. You need to disciple your wife, and you need to help your wife to grow in grace. And I haven't done as well at that as I would like to have done. But my wife is one of the best practical theologians I know. And so talk about people that don't take anything off of me. You know, I mean, she knows it. And if uh, 
you know, you start getting these emails and people say, oh, man, we love this, we love this. And I'm thinking, oh, it's you know, pretty good. And my wife said, yeah, but you didn't pick yeah. up your socks yesterday. Yeah. And so uh, <clears throat> yeah. it's just, it's good to have a, a... You can preach a sermon. You can't keep your room clean. <laughs> that's that's yeah. right, you know. So uh, to help and Then you your, had a bunch of kids onto that, too? Oh, I know, I know. You know, I used to think it was cute when they would answer all those theological questions and catechism books, but now they understand the issues big enough to apply them to their father. So, uh, so. <laughs> But, I mean, but it really is a, a good thing. It's a gift. It's a blessing to cultivate that in your marriage where, you know, don't, don't squelch your wife and, and help your wife to access the tools, the relationships in the church and opportunities to grow in grace and then help her to know how to call you out, to not let you get away with stuff. Yeah, yeah. embolden people around you to hold you accountable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Um, Vodi, when you, this is kind of connecting with Tom's message, when you made a decision to leave Houston and go to Lusaka, how did you know that that was God's will? I think just through your experience um, and what you had to wrestle through, uh, the painful experience, ripping part of your heart out yeah. as you leave, um, you don't do that lightly. No. So I wonder if you could just take us through a little bit of that yeah. decision making. I think it's instructive. Even yeah. if people aren't pastors, they're making decisions as well and trying to figure out God's will for them. Yeah, and, and we left our two oldest kids here too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, and now three, yank, three grandkids. Um, but I, I would say that the Lord called me to Zambia um, back in 2008. It's two years after we had, we had started GFBC, and I went for the first time. And I really sensed the Lord's calling. That's... That's an um, awkward sense. In, in 2008. Right after you started it. Yep. Wow. Yeah, I, I sensed the Lord. I didn't, know, I didn't know what that would look like. I didn't know, you know, any of that. But, but I, I, I had that sense. But, but there were two boxes that, that needed to be checked off. Um, one was, was my wife, right? Um, I, I, God gave me my wife put me in a one flesh relationship with my wife. So uh, I don't come home and say, you know, hey, guess what, you know? Um, so it, it took eight years for the Lord to call her. And so, and then, even then, that wasn't a done deal because when both of us had that sense, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of an eldership. So what I didn't do was come to my fellow elders and say, the Lord's called us, we're going. Mm -hmm. I came to my fellow elders and I said, here's where we are, what say you? Mm -hmm. And our elders had the authority to say no to that. If they didn't, then we're liars about what we say we believe. And so we put that before our elders and asked them, to be our elders. You know, none of this, you know, I had a dream, I had a vision, here it is, we're gone, right? Um, but I, I, I believe Hebrews 13, 17, right? Um, that, that, that these men are, were, were exercising that, that authority in my life and shepherding um, me and my, my family. So that was the second step. And when I brought it to them, you know, they spent some time with it and then came back to us affirming um, that call. And so it was only then that, uh, that we made the move. It's really helpful. A couple of our elders met with a church member who, older man, retired, uh, free to go, had the means to go wherever he wants to go, and he had the humility uh, to come to the elders and say, do you think I should do this, or do you think I should do that? Yeah. And he's praying through those issues. That's a, that's a remarkable testimony. It's not something you hear, especially from somebody who's a type A leader, uh, hard charger. That's not what you hear. That's, that's something to take note of, to cultivate that kind of humility. It's, it's because of that that I needed it all the more. Yeah. Because yeah. I right. would have the tendency left to my own devices to be very impulsive, right? And to just go and not think about all the things that need to be thought about. And so I, I need those people in my life who say, okay, great, but what about this? 
because I'm not thinking about that. I'm going squirrel, right? <laughs> and I'm, you know, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly important. And it's also, again, it's important if we believe what we say we believe, mm-hmm. you know? Um, if, it's, it's one thing to say that we believe, you know, the ecclesiology of the church, you know, ought to be an, an eldership, right? But, but then, do we really believe that? And if we really believe that, um, how, do we, how do we function in a way that proves it? You know? I just want to underscore that that fits exactly what you said earlier about it's an ordinary means of grace. Yes. So you're not looking for a vision or a dream or yeah. some kind of three by five card floating down from heaven. You just saying, okay, this is what we want to do. This, God's put this on our heart. Brothers, help yeah. us. That, yeah. that, it's ordinary. It's fascinating to see how many uh, people, I think, Christians, evangelicals, have been groomed for decades to do their thinking isolated from the local church, yeah. away from the elders. They don't see the elders as, as assets to them, mm-hmm. but rather as hindrances getting in the way of what they want. And I think that really is, uh, we are a culture that has trained us to do exactly what you want. Just yeah. do it, just do it, just do it. And I w- I'm not the only pastor that has this experience, I know, but people will come, and what they're looking for is not really counsel. They're looking for affirmation on decisions stamp. already made. Yeah. yeah, I made this decision, uh, and whenever, whenever it comes out that way where God's told me or God's leading me, you know, I just listen, and, and they'll say, well, what do you think about that? I said, why do you care what I think about it if God told you to do it? You know, who am I to say anything? You've already heard from the Lord. He told you to do something. I'm not going to tell you not to do it. But it's, it's, it is that exact thing you described. It's this individualistic, you know, God's given me this, I'm going to do it, and I want you to approve it and not question it, not say anything that might set me back on my heels to reconsider. And I, I'm, I refuse to play that game. Uh, Tom, your opening ins- illustration, uh, that was really helpful, the bricklayer, the wall builder, the cathedral builder. Just for folks who may be on the the brink of a, a decision that they've got to make, and they are wondering about, what if I don't find significance in my work? Mm. You know, what if I've got, I've got legitimate questions about that? Where is the line between maybe sin and righteousness on this issue for maybe, for example, you know, it might be a, a misuse of your time and talents to be full-time professional Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know, or, and definitely a waste of your time. Not time to try, right? To try. Okay, I got you. <laughs> but, but if, if you did have the time or talents to do something else and mm-hmm. This is what God has called you to do. You could make different decisions. You did make different decisions. Same thing for people who aren't in vocational ministry but are in other vocations. Where is the line with that maybe godly discontentment and then maybe discontentment, discontentment? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I I, I quoted Calvin from book three of his institutes where he talks about avoiding flitting because you're, you're settled on your sense of being called by God. You've been given a station. Pers- and it's whatever God's commanded you got to do, what he's forbidden you can't do, and now we're in the realm of, all right, you're free to do or not do, and you want, to, you want wisdom, you want to get the most bang for your buck, and God invests things in people. Sometimes we can't see everything God's invested in us. You know, Augustine did not want to become the Bishop of Hippo, and they, they dragged him into doing that. Uh, Calvin did not want to be the pastor uh, in Geneva, and he was threatened with damnation <laughs> if he didn't do it. A scrawny you know. finger pointed in his That's chest. That's right. You know, God will damn your studies if you don't stay here. So, you know, um, so it, they had it in them. They didn't see it. And that's where the body comes in. That's where good counsel from other believers come in, too. But I think it's, all, it's, it's really good, too, to evaluate yourself. Say, okay, you know, I can do this over here. And it can be good for the kingdom, but I can do this over here, and it can be good for the kingdom. You've got two good choices. You, you seek counsel, and then you take your choice, and you're confident that when you step out that, that God is going to own that. And if it flops, okay, well, then it'll flop to his glory, and maybe you'll get up and do something different in the wake of that. Personally, the way I've operated personally with that is with such a sense of God's providence. I know right now I'm where I'm supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Not because I'm so smart or holy or anything, but because God's sovereign. 
right? So if God didn't want me on this stage right now, I wouldn't be on this stage right now. That's his providence. He's got me in Cape Coral pastoring this church. Does that mean I'm never going to do anything different? I'm in this vocation. I'm a mechanic. I'm never going to be a school teacher? No, maybe. If I have an inclination for that and I learn and figure out a way to do that and can do it and people say, yeah, it'd be a good thing. You would serve the kingdom well in that. Then I think I'm free to pursue it. But the burden of proof is always on the move. You know, I'm, I am where I am by God's providential arrangement. If it's lawful, and I'm not playing games and being honest and open, then the burden of proof is the, the change. And it happens. It happens. But it's, uh, that's been a, just a helpful, safe guide for me through the years. Yeah. Amen. The, um, you mentioned, I believe it was you mentioning Luther and Martin Luther developing a, or rediscovering or developing or articulating a doctrine of vocation and, and especially in Germany at that time where you've got a, you get a massive change going on. I mean, rise of banking and, and the, the loans being made to people that are merchants that can then break free from some of the class structures and strictures and rigid uh, class structure. So there's a, there's a change and it's freeing people up not to be stuck in some particular rut. So um, I know it's an oversimplification to say it this way, but when you're given, when you're freed from being, say, being a slave, being uh, stuck following the plow, or your father was a bootmaker, so you're a bootmaker, and it goes back generations, um, tinkers and, and tailors and all those other vocations that they were part, it was part of their family. Now they're able to make decisions. There's upward mobility, sideward mobility. That's a stewardship. There's a stewardship of choice in that. So how do you encourage people to, especially think about many young people, with choices in front of them? They're not in a certain career. And you're thinking, Tom, about the good of society. How would you encourage Christian young people to think about the stewardship of those choices, the kinds of decisions that they should make, where the training they should pursue for the good of the kingdom, for the good of the body of Christ? Yeah, I think, first of all, what I would say is you've got to do whatever's going to be best for your soul. You, you've got to do, if you're not well-grounded, biblically, spiritually, in a church where you're getting good counsel. I mean, if, if those things are iffy, then, you know, you might be able to make a billion bucks but it's not going to be good for you, you know, th th these foundational things. So even, like, education. You know, all of our kids went to college that wanted to go to I guess all of them went to college. I don't, I don't think they all graduated. But it, our, our view of college was kind of like, you know, you're, you're the Israelites on the way out of Egypt, you know, just, just take it for all you can and get what you want. It's good, and that's <laughs> fine. Uh, but don't worry about a degree or anything like that. If you get a degree, that's fine. But that's just kind of our attitude. But they all went to college locally to stay in this church. And I've had people say, you know, we're looking at colleges across the land, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But my first piece of counsel to them when they ask is, find a school that's got a good church nearby. You know, I, just, I wouldn't send a kid to, in, in usual circumstances, maybe exceptions. But under normal circumstances, just wouldn't send an 18-year-old off to a college where there's no church. So fundamentally, you got to do what's best for your soul. And if this decision is going to take you away from the path that's going to get you more anchored in the Word of God spiritually, uh, I would discourage it until you get those things settled. As that gets settled, then, man, where do you get the most bang for your buck? you only got a few years to live. How can you get the most out of it for what really matters? And that might include finances. You know, it might include... Uh, opportunities in different places of the world, but only in a secondary way to what will bring most glory to God. That's the battle. That's the, how do you figure that out, that you can most glorify God? And those are judgment calls at times. You, know, you mentioned upward mobility, sideward mobility. I'm thinking about those two Moravians that offered to sell themselves into slavery so they could get into a country as missionaries. That's called downward mobility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's for the, sake the glory of, the, of God. But Amen. for the sake of the kingdom. You know, I'll be a slave if I can get the gospel over there. It's that kind of mentality. If, and I do think it goes hand in hand with this idea of calling. I am called by my Savior and commissioned to be a part of his work in this world. And that's settled. So now it's just the details of where do I do that the best. And I can get counsel for that. It may be this for one season of my life. And it's going to be that for the other season. And, you know, we all get older and we can't do as much as we used to do when we were younger. But hopefully we can 
think about things a little better than when we were younger. And so the stewardship of those gifts can shift. But, man, it's, it's bang for the buck when you understand what the bang is. How different is, are these questions in Lusaka than they are in Cape Coral? Um, they're, they're different in the sense that opportunities are not the same. You know, um, this is the land of opportunity, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're different in that regard. I, I think the unemployment rate in Zambia is somewhere in, in the 60s, percentage-wise, you know. Um, so they're, they're, uh, they're, they're different in, in, in that sense. Um, so how are you speaking to young people who come to you with the same kind of, these same kind of questions? How are you helping them to think through? Yeah, the same, the same way. It, the, the principles are the same, okay. right? Regardless of where you are, um, just when there are fewer opportunities, right. makes it easier to, <laughs> to narrow things down, you know? Uh, but, but, but yeah, we, we, we are. Yeah, and, when you're one of, one of 20 people applying for the job. Yeah, you know? and, it's, and it's, it's, it's a stewardship, you know? And for us, you know, one of the things that we're really trying to help people uh, our students at ACU, for example, wrap their heads around is, is entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and creating opportunities, you know, and... Um, well, that's where we may be coming together is more and more Christians are getting shoved out of the workplace because yeah. of their Christianity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think more Christians are thinking more about entrepreneurship yeah. as well here. Amen. Is yeah, that, you yeah absolutely. No, I, I highly recommend that. And one of the challenges we have here is that it's... Uh, you've got this widespread, deeply held misunderstanding of the nature of the Christian life, as we, you just mm -hmm. talked about. And so where that's not present, you know, you, just, you get these young people that have grown up with misunderstandings or not really good teaching about the nature of the Christian life anchored in a community of faith. And, uh, and they just, I mean, I've got this, I want to do this, I want to do this, I can do that. And you can just listen in the way they taught. They've been better discipled by the world than they have the church. It's just their values, their, their approaches to making decisions. And so those are fundamental issues that need to be remediated uh, the best you can. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't start when they're 18. So let's go to the other end of the age spectrum and talk about people who, you know, post-vocation, post post-career. Now they've, uh, they've got some free time. Uh, could be limited means, could be more means. Uh, what, you know, a lot of, uh, every, every time a new iPhone comes out, it reinforces the idea in our culture that what's old is useless. Yeah. It's shelved, it's thrown away. So speak to the people on the other side of that yeah. and say, how do, we, how do we deploy those people and get them invested in the church, invested in the kingdom, and invested in younger lives? I think by pointing out just that, right? That that season in your life is an opportunity to invest. And that, you know, the sad reality is people usually don't last very long when they stop investing, you know? Uh, you just, the, 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 the idea of retiring and doing nothing is, first of all, it's grossly unbiblical. Um, but, but Secondly, it's not healthy. Um, so we, we need to help people to realize that and then to help them understand how great the needs are. Um, it, it's, it's amazing, you know, people, and then people want to retire early, right? Just when you're not dumb anymore, <laughs> just when you know something and are good at something and could probably be teaching people and be more effective and fruitful, you, you know, take your toys and go home. And that, that's, that's bad stewardship, you know? So we have to, we have to help people um, understand that and understand how valuable that can be in, in the body and, and in the community at large as well. How do you, I'm sorry to interrupt you, how, how do you help them, especially uh, those who are 16 and above, to overcome the intimidation that they have of these young people, you know, if they have a question, they don't ask somebody with gray hair. They go to Google. They ask their question, they get their answer, and they move on. Enough of that. 
younger people become wise in their own eyes. They kind of have a lot of knowledge, not, not a lot of wisdom, but a lot of knowledge. Yeah. And it's difficult, I think, for older people to overcome that hurdle, that barrier that they feel. Do uh, you guys sense that same thing as you're talking to older people? And I was wondering how you overcome it. I am one of those older people, so I'm kind of feeling a little nervous here where you're going with this question. But. Well, Tom, I <laughs> wanted to talk about how outdated you are. And, uh, no, no, but just wondering how you, uh, this is, you know, Florida is a retirement community. Yeah. Well, a lot what of people come down here to live the dream of John Piper, you know, picking up seashells. I know. So. I got a picture from one of those guys today on my phone that sent to me on the beach picking up Showing seashells. Showing you a seashell? That's right. Um, well, one of the, the blessings in, in this church is we have, over the years, we just had older people, retired people, who could do a lot of things, and they just, they invest, man. I mean, you, I could point to half a dozen probably here tonight that are mentoring, discipling, teaching, serving, you know, the, driving people to places they need to get that can't drive themselves, and uh, Filling in, talked to one of our men tonight, and he's volunteering. And so, how did you get to do this? He said, "Well, I just saw that there was a need. Well, hey, I can do this." And you know, he could be doing a lot of other things with his time, but this is something that he wants to do, can invest in. That type of attitude. I, when our kids were young, uh, when we came to this church, it was exclusively with maybe I don't know. I think I was the youth group. My wife and I were the youth group when we came to this church, and uh, so everybody else was retirement age and above. But amongst those, you know, as things sifted out over a few years, the ones that were left, they were godly people. And it was just great to point, for my kids to point to them and say, look, look at brother so-and-so, look at sister so-and-so, be like her, be like him. And uh, that's a, I don't know, I, I suppose there might be some intimidation factors with our people. I don't, if it, I'm not much aware of it. The way you frame that question, I'd have to really think about it. Because there may be some of that, but at least within the context of the church, I would think that wouldn't be the norm. I think that would probably be less than average. But it might be there. So I just might be unaware of it. All right. Do you have anything on that? Or did I frame the question wrong? <laughs> no, no. All right, all right. I, um, I think that uh, some of that older generation um, the kind of things that they can invest to younger lives, it is exactly as you said that they, they have a, a, a new chapter that's open in the book uh, for them to give themselves to the younger. You talked about risk of intimacy, and um, you, know, you spoke as someone who's risked. I was wondering what kind of risks have you personally gone through or you seen people go through that you know, things can come back to bite you, and why is that worth it? For a younger generation that is groomed to do everything online, to keep people at a distance, why is that risk worth it? Worth it? I, because our souls need it. We need each other. We need the body. Uh, it's no, no one person has everything, right? We're, we're one body of many members, and the body of Christ is a rich blessing to us, a rich blessing to our souls, right? And we, we may not even realize it, but our souls crave it because that's what, that's what we're made for, you know? Um, and so it, it, is, it is worth it. Um, it it's, it's hard, you know? It's painful. I had a couple of people come up, a couple of pastors <laughs> come up afterwards, you know, um, just kind of sharing, not even details, but just... I get you, <laughs> um, and it, it is, that's, you know, that, that's, but that's, that's who we are, right? That, that's who we are. Yeah. It's like when you get married, you know? Um, one, of the, one of the most difficult things um, about marriage you know, for newly married people is the disillusionment that happens when you have this idea that, you know, our love is the greatest love in the history of all loves, and because our love is so great that it may be hard for other people, but that's just because they don't have a love that is a love like our love, which is the greatest love in the history of all loves, and then all of a sudden they run into a buzzsaw, and it's difficult, and then they, they want to go jump off a building because if our love 
ran into this, then, you know, and we, we, we end up disillusioned like that because, because we don't understand that there is that risk to intimacy and that we are sinners. And then we start telling ourselves lies like, you know, if you really love me, then you wouldn't sin against me like this. Well, it's because I love you that we are living in such proximity. And when two sinners live in proximity to one another, they sin more against each other than they do against the people who are way over there, right? So it's because I love you that I sin against you so much, right? <laughs> um, and so I, I think it's hugely problematic when we, when, we, when we don't understand this and when we don't prepare ourselves for this and when we don't from a, bring proper theological understanding to that um, so that we let love cover a multitude of sins, right? Um, so that we learn how to reconcile. Um, you know, that, it's just, those are beautiful things that we desperately need. Yeah, how are you going to... How are you going to learn how to forgive if you don't live close enough to people to offend you? Yeah. You know, I see it as part of my job is teaching people how to forgive. <laughs> I do it pretty well, too. Yeah. But, uh, I, I get that. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but it's true. I mean, you know, you don't get hurt if you don't live that way and you don't learn how to forgive. You don't learn how to forgive as you've been forgiven, which we're called upon to do. Yeah. And that just goes with it. And so the consequences and you know, the story's not over, too, man. I mean, that's the other thing. Amen. You see things happen and you see people walk away and you think, oh, gosh, I can't believe that. The story's not over. Yeah. God's, God's doing a thousand things. And um, sometimes I like to think of my life like, you know, th there's this tapestry that God is weaving together. It's beautiful. It's not finished yet. It's going to be awesome. And he, he's put me down here in this little corner. And I get the opportunity to, to try to fix that corner just right. And if you look at that corner, it's not much, but man, it is a part of this whole deal. Yeah. And so things right now might be all messed up, but it's not over. So just live with that. But there's another side of it too. And, and if you've met people who've decided to bail on that risk, if, if you've met people who've decided, no, I'm gonna go live my life in isolation, right? If, if you've ever had the opportunity to meet somebody who's done that for decades or whatever. What you realize is that in avoiding this risk and pain over here, they've embraced a pain mm -hmm. that's even deeper mm -hmm. because we weren't made to live like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They become two-dimensional people, uh, very hollow inside yep. and, and useless for yep. good work out there too. Yeah, so that risk of, uh, that risk of either offending somebody else or being offended, being hurt, and you know, all those things that um, they're trying to avoid are the very things that God's trying to draw out of our hearts Amen. to shape us more like Christ, conform us to Him. Yeah. How do you see then, let's just, maybe one final question I've got, um, how do you see that then being attractive? It's, it's an anti-Christian world, it's becoming anti more so. How do you see that though? Being the, being the, the um, sweet smell of Christ out there in the world, even in a non-Christian world, an anti-Christian world, all the formation, all the hurt, the shaping, the difficulty, the risk, the pain, um, all the offending, confessing sin, asking forgiveness, being granted forgiveness, all that stuff going on in the local church across generations. How is that then made attractive to people out there? in the workplace, in government, everywhere else? How are Christians um, spreading the Savior of Christ that way? Well, I, I think in one sense it's inevitable. If you're getting it and you're enjoying it, it's going to just exude out of you. And, and that's happened. I mean, we all have those stories, but uh, I hear them pretty regularly from folks that are in workplace, in relationships with extended family, and uh, there will be a death or a sickness or some tragedy and the, inevitably there's something like this, I don't, you know, how did you stay so calm, or I don't know how you did it, or I mean, your church really rallied around you, and, and those things are just, it's not because you're trying to do it, it's just the way you live. And we can, we can live in that environment in some ways where we lose sight of the fact that this is really different than what is out there because we are, we're living together in the church, but we ought to 
welcome people into that. Give them a taste of that. I mean, it's the, the, the church, when it's functioning well, helps to kind of put the gospel on display. It's, it's a horrible, that's why church splits and disharmony is, are so wicked, because we're, teach, we're, we're sending a message, we're preaching a message that you can be reconciled to God. We're preaching a message of love, and we can't even get along with one another. And it's just, we, we put a lie to the message we profess. But whenever it's working, it's like, yeah, you know, man, there's something different in your relationship. You call each other brother and sister, it's like you mean it. And so you pick up the phone, you call somebody or text somebody, and they're at your house. And they, they will drop everything to help you. And there's, that's the grace of God at work. That's the way normal Christianity is. And whenever you put that together, and you cultivate it, and you try to keep the weeds out when they pop up, and you repent, and you forgive, and you get up and keep going. Uh, there is something uh, very compelling about that. Yeah, it, it is. And, and when, we, when we allow the Lord to use that, um, he does. You know, when, when, we, when we don't hide our light under a bushel, um, and live that and make it known and and don't try to pretend like we're perfect or <laughs> our life is perfect or I- anything else um it it is a, a fragrant aroma you know because people are it's a, it's a lost hurting and dying world right um and we found the words of life mm. that's attractive if we'll let it be known Good word. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, you can close us in prayer. Yeah, let's do that. Why don't we stand up and we'll pray. <clears throat> Father, we've talked about wonderful things tonight, and uh, we've been reminded of your grace and mercies to us over the course of lifetimes. And We can't help but offer up praise and thanksgiving to you for your faithfulness. We, we know that we have fallen. We know that we would fall a thousand times a day if it weren't for your spirit who upholds us and the grace that operates through your word and spirit and leading us back to Christ, grounding us in him and helping us to find our deepest longings and desires and needs met in him. So we pray that you would take what we've talked about this evening and help us to sort through it, to evaluate what has been said biblically and where we need to repent. Grant us that grace. Lord, please make us quick repenters. Don't, don't, Don't let us live trying to figure out ways to justify our sin. Help us to see Christ and be so convinced that the grace that is in him is real and sufficient that we will quickly turn from sin, confess it, look to him, live without condemnation. Where we've been sinned against, help us to forgive. And where we've sinned against others, Lord, help us to go and make things right. and Build churches, build churches where this power of the gospel is put on display and help each one of us in this room to be committed to pursuing life together with other brothers and sisters in local churches to that end. Dismiss us with your blessing tonight. Go with us. Watch over us. We pray for you to bless the conference tomorrow. Some will still be traveling in. Lord, watch over them. Keep them safe. And uh, may we have a sweet time together around your word. For We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.